I've been avoiding Dr. Rezai for a little while because I'm going to slam him with a tough one. So the workup. So you got to. You got. You, what What do you do? I mean, do you do a colonoscopy? I mean, and I guess this depends on age, right? If you have a 25 year old woman in your office, what do you do there versus a 50 year old man or woman in your office coming with the same symptoms? You know, we're going to talk about all these things: colonoscopy, you know, imaging, breath testing. Go at it. Tell me what you right. do. So, as Brandon mentioned, so when, whenever there is alarm features, that's the part that we sometimes focus on the fact that, okay, maybe there's something else is going on, and then we kind of uh, assess the patient. For example, as you mentioned, if the age is more than 50 and IBS starts, uh, that's the time that we're thinking, okay, are we dealing with microscopic colitis? Is this a large polyp? Is this cancer? So that's the time that... Uh, we do colonoscopy, for example. Um, but as you said, if it's a 25-year-old, uh, otherwise healthy uh, individual with IBS symptoms, that necessarily doesn't warrant doing a colonoscopy. The majority of these tests uh, are designed to rule out other causes that can um, cause IBS-like symptoms. For example, stool tests ruling out a Giardia, for example, or doing colonoscopy for cause, uh, causes that I mentioned, uh, or doing a set of blood work uh, or inflammatory markers to make sure that we're not de dealing with an inflammatory disease. Uh, but there are other uh, tests uh, that are still uh, that are out there as well. For example, you mentioned uh, breath testing. Um, you can do breath testing for carbohydrate malabsorption, uh, lactose intolerance. Uh, and other carbohydrate malabsorption can lead to symptoms that uh, are similar to IBS as well, especially if you're um, s uh, suspecting those on your history. But now you have a recent study that suggests breath tests might predict response to drugs. Can you just yeah, comment so on that? Yeah, so that, that gets me to lactulose breath testing, which uh, doesn't necessarily diagnose irritable bowel syndrome. It diagnoses small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. But there is an overlap between patients with uh, IBS and a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, and uh, in a study that Dr. Lembo uh, led, uh, Target 3, a subgroup of patients underwent lactulose uh, breath testing. And that showed uh, that that can predict response to therapy uh, for patients with IBS diarrhea uh, to rifaximin. Uh, which is an uh, interesting concept because uh, we don't have uh, many determinative response in IBS patients, uh, and that was successful to do that. So a biomarker like that might be helpful to answer your question, Bill or Tony. I mean, if you can cultivate the patient who might respond, that might be a good thing to optimize, cost less, get the treatment faster. Uh, Tony, thoughts on that? Uh, no, I agree. If, um, I think that's what we're looking for is a, is a biomarker um, that can predict outcome. I, th I think it's probably worth just stepping back for a second and talking like about a patient that comes through the door. I mean, if someone who presents to my office with you know typical IBS uh, di with diarrhea uh, symptoms, you know, in my mind, I'm kind of thinking. Um, and again, each person's a little different, depends on the chronicity and the absence of you know, no alarm features. But you still want to rule out a few basic things. I mean, I think we still want to do, uh, make sure they don't have celiac disease and it's recommended that these patients uh, have a TTG antibody because occasionally you see it, it's not very common, um, probably less than 1%, but that is a different treatment algorithm. Uh, if, if they have celiac disease. We usually, like I'll oftentimes will check stool for ovum and parasite, although extremely rare. Uh, it depends, sometimes these people are tra have been traveling. I think that's reasonable to do. And sometimes in the back of my mind, I'm, you know, the big differential is clearly, do they have inflammatory bowel disease? And, 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 and sometimes Crohn's disease can present with chronic uh, diarrhea that's intermittent with left, you know, chronic pain. And so there we'll do inflammatory markers. And Bill has done a really nice study look, showing that if you have a low CRP, which is a serum test for inflammation, and a calprotectin, uh, which is a stool marker for inflammation, that the odds of having inflammatory bowel disease is extremely likely, unlikely. And what I see in our practice, a lot of these people are going undergoing colonoscopies to exclude it, where they don't really need it. They're 25 years old, they've had chronic diarrhea, and with these tests you can exclude it. So that's what I would do in a patient. And some, you know, we always do a CBC in patients too. And some people would argue maybe doing a, looking at their thyroid uh, with a TSH. 
and that's pretty much the game. So it's not an extensive you know, uh, Berea tests and we, you know, in, in, the pa in most patients. So there is a new blood test that helps diagnose perhaps post-infectious IVS. The disclaimer is I helped develop and commercialize it, but I'm going to ask you to comment and not me comment on it. Do you have any thoughts on where that could play a role in IBS? Sure. So th this test looks at antibodies to anti-vinculin and anti-CDTB. So it really looks for infection. So patients, as we talked about, uh, infection is a pretty common cause, um, probably the most common cause uh, for IBS. And this test has been shown that if you have a positive test, uh, that the odds are that you have uh, IBS are extremely high in the you know in the mid mid to upper ninety percent range. So you can rule in IBS d with diarrhea um, in those patients. So I think for the person that uh, that is uncomfortable to diagnosis, um, that that this may play a role and can reduce further testing uh, for them.